love dogs. I love dogs, too. Glad we're all on the same page. Five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Sarah Andreco Show. So, Anne, um, thank you truly from the bottom of my heart for doing this. I know it's kind of crazy times right now, and your schedule is probably pretty packed, especially getting your honorary PhD, which I'm excited to hear about. But um, I got to tell you, giraffes are one of my favorite animals on the planet. It's one of those animals that I've always wanted to work with and have never had the opportunity to. One of two animals, giraffes and bats. I love bats, too. I don't know why. Two very different species. But um, you are such a pioneer of your time, not just from an animal behavior perspective, because you were not only one of the first people to ever study animals um, in the wild, observing their natural behavior, but one of the first women in general. So, you know, they have all these founding fathers supposedly out there of ethology. And I always have to laugh a little bit that even though they were kind of born a little bit by before your time, like Lorenz and Von Frisch and Tinberg, I'm like, why aren't they throwing you in the mix of, of being a founder of ethology as well, being one of the first people ever to study uh, animal behavior in the wild? So I'm really excited to learn from you, to chat with you, and to talk about some of these amazing accomplishments that you've had throughout your lifetime from... I mean, I think you've had over 60 publications and um, not only just in animal behavior, but in social justice and gender equality as well. So you've done an amazing amount of work in your lifetime, and I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. So thank you, Anne, so very much for joining me for this conversation today. Well, it's lovely to have someone who's interested in one. <laughs> Yes, you've lived a fascinating life. If I could have a second life, I would very much love to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> See? <laughs> Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, especially in your time, you know, deciding to kind of just fresh out of college, run off to Africa and just follow your dreams and, you know, go explore the one thing that since you were what, age three, I think had always fascinated you to just go out there and be in their environment. <laughs> So I'm curious too, is of all of these wonderful women in your time that probably had similar dreams, what do you think the one thing is that set you apart, that set you on that journey to go pursue a career well, like that? People are always asking that and I really don't have any idea because <laughs> I, I loved animals and I took the university and I took zoology, of course, and um, and then no one else really wanted to go and d discover animals. Really. So I thought I'd go, I'd have to go myself, which was some, um, turned out to be a really good idea. <laughs> Although my mother. Yeah. Wasn't and sure. you put in some, yeah. <laughs> your mother wasn't sure, but she supported you, right? She was behind you. Oh yeah. She did support me. I think she's, you know, sad. I wasn't going to be there anymore, but, uh, but she sent me letters and, letters to the man that uh, let me work on his farm. And yeah, she was really good. <laughs> which I, I watched your documentary recently, The Woman Who Loves Giraffes, which is fantastic. So for anybody that's listening, I highly recommend that you watch that documentary. But it was interesting because you had a very difficult time, from what I understand, actually finding a place to go stay over in Africa just because you were female, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes, it was very, very irritating. <laughs> and I kept thinking, <laughs> I didn't think anyone could be like that. It just seemed to me so ridiculous. Yeah, kind but of strange. More and more. They were, you know, it's exactly what the men didn't think, I guess. And you were initially applying under your name, and then you figured you <laughs> yes. change it to an initial. So that <laughs> changed to initials, right? Didn't yeah, you? yeah. Yeah, you had to put a little trickery under so that they wouldn't think about that. But then he ended up finding out um, that you were a female and still still allowed you to come and, and stay. Yeah, that was really very nice of him. He didn't have to. He didn't know me from the hole in the wall. Uh, he was, but he thought since I'd come all that way and was in a thousand kilometers, I guess, at that point, he might as well have me there and see how it works out. Yeah, and put you to work. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you end up staying in Africa that first trip to study? Okay, it was mostly a, a year, I guess. I, I'm not sure exactly. And then I went back to England and, and got married and um, then was married. <laughs> and then back to Canada from that. And then, yeah. then we toured around and then visited back to Canada. 
And how many, um, cause I know that you, some, they were talking in the documentary too, about some of your journals and your writings from your observations that wound up becoming your first book on giraffes. But how many hours a day would you say you were putting in just writing down your observations and, and seeing these giraffes in the wild, in the field? Oh, pro- oh probably 10, 10, 10 hours a day. I was there. Um, I, my, Mr. Matthew got me up at five in the morning, so Ooh. I wouldn't waste time. And then I had to go and walk for five, and then I had to come in for breakfast, and then for lunch, and then and dinner. So it was um, probably ten hours a day, doing nothing but drop walk. Right out in the field, yeah, and so, always in your car. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I had to yeah. the car so it didn't upset the draft. <laughs> and that were really- yeah, I had to laugh at. Um- it, the one part where they're talking about how you got out and just practiced a little ballet because you were so bored. And then yeah. all of a sudden you had to get back in the car because the drafts noticed you. And I think that's, that's important. Like you were trying very much not to disrupt them in their natural habitat. So you could study them as they are so that we could better understand their behavior. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, it's if you interfere, it, it ruins it completely. So I had to get right into the car again. <laughs> <laughs> What would you say were some of your favorite parts about spending your days out there observing them? Uh, well, I think getting out early in the morning, I've never been out at five or so. And uh, it was getting light and, and it was it was just so beautiful. And then I'd see a few giraffe and I had a this open this, um, car that was very small. And then I could go and watch it and make notes about who was doing what and if some are nearer than others and that thing's. Oh, I've forgotten the question now. Uh, well, you could also mention just in terms of what were some of your favorite memories, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The like. first time you saw a giraffe yeah. would have been huge. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I, when, I, when I saw the first giraffe, I was near uh, the, uh, where the car was. And I thought, well, I'll go over and introduce myself because they'll want to know me. <laughs> so, so, I, so I walked over and then I realized that when I walked this a little bit this way, then they would walk away. And I was thinking, oh, dear, I'm upsetting them. So if what I'm doing is ruining the whole thing. So then I went back and got into the car and I never got out again. So <laughs> whenever I wanted to move, I could move in a car, but they weren't being um, they, were, they weren't getting excited because of me. I guess they were annoyed about the car. but. Mm. Often they were quite far away and then, you know, maybe um, 30 feet or so. Yeah. Because so. that, that was big headache. And then the first time you saw one drinking as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was amazing. And then when it finished the drink, I thought it would lower, um, lift its head really slowly because of the uh, difference in that would be <laughs> lightheaded <laughs> and dizzy. And then it came flying up as, uh, in, a, in a huge hurry. And that, that worked out. Perfectly. So all sorts of small things that you had thought you'd never see. And then there you did see them. It was really exciting. Yeah. That's, Every day there seemed to be something new. The fun part about actually being able to observe and to learn exactly what it is they do. You would think that coming up that fast that they would just get dizzy. But I'm guessing that's a, a survival mechanism. Is that what that's for? Uh, just based on not getting, you know, crocodile or, or predators? Or is that kind of from your experience why they do that? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because that's probably their most vulnerable point is when their head is uh, down. Yeah, right. and they can't see very well. They're so low. So they got to get right? out fast. So they have to be able to get up and watch for the lions or what other predators are out there. Well, and that. But luckily, there weren't many lions on this farm. They No one wanted a lion around. They were always getting rid of them. Yeah. Um, go to some Just other farm. Shooting them. Right. Okay. Well, not shooting them usually. Oh. Okay. What was the farm? What were they doing at the farm? What was it about? The lions? No, no, the farm that you were oh, at. Oh, it was, um, what, what was it? I think it was a citrus farm. Citrus. So there was a lot of trees, or oh, sorry, orange trees. And there were, there was a lot of, um, wasn't that awful? I forgot <laughs> what sort of. <laughs> it was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. trees. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just kept uh, far enough away from them so they weren't really uh, attracted to me or I, and, and they ignored me after quite quite quickly. So that worked out well, thank goodness. 
<laughs> well, what a cool experience to watch a giraffe drinking live because it's not like watching any other creature on the planet drink water. You know, That's we see right. dogs and cats and people, and it's so incredibly different from any other species. It's fantastic. Yeah. So I bet that was a pretty interesting experience for the first time. And it would have been uh, often if there were a couple of giraffes when one was drinking. And I think if that giraffe had been alone, they might have been, and there had been a lion in the area, I think it'd be very, um, would maybe smell at her because they probably wouldn't be down because that was where they're vulnerable. If a, a lion wants mm -hmm. one, they'll, they'll grab it onto the neck and that would be the end of the mm. animal. Did you ever witness anything like that while observing? No, no, I'm thank heaven so. <laughs> it would have been terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's interesting, you bring up the lions and I think of all of the predators that are in the African plains. And I mean, I, I was almost on the edge of my seat, but I, I know that you lived through it. But the scary part about when you first arrived to Africa and your car broke down and you walked for like an hour and we're just like, how on earth? Talk about luck being on your side and not getting, <laughs> you know, caught yeah. by a lion or something else. It's like, oh, look at this human for dinner tonight. Yeah. So but why? Why? I was I've often wondered why I did that. I mean, it was completely stupid. If I were in the car with a lion, which it, which it was, it, the giraffe couldn't, no, the lions couldn't get me, no one could get me, and the snakes couldn't get me. And yet, after about a minute, I was thinking, I'm going to go mad if I don't get out of here. I just, I just, I'm just scared stiff, and I'm, <laughs> I've got to get out. So I stepped right out. And yeah, that's pretty amazing. Stuff. Talk about some bravery right there. <laughs> Well, part of it was just stupid, really, but just I just had to because I was just so frightened. Well, I'm so glad you didn't get eaten by a lion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so while you were there and um, you took these extensive journals and notes about all the behavior that you observed and you wound up putting it all together in the first book that you wrote about giraffes. And then I read also that um, some years down the road, and I'm curious as to how many, maybe uh, 20, 30 years later, you wrote an additional book about giraffes. And you had mentioned something about um, changing some things that you thought were inaccurate. What were some of the differences from that very first book that you wrote that you changed or said were different from what you thought your observations had shown in that second book? Uh, well, it's not, I can't really remember individually, but I know that another man who I knew quite well um, was working with giraffe as well. Oh no, I've forgotten my... Yeah, it was um, where they were talking about when you watch giraffes, they look to be just loosely walking around yeah, and not really connected to each other. But I think lots of study that happened afterwards found that they actually do have a connection. Yeah, and, and yeah, they do move. And um, all of them actually pretty well are in the small or maybe five or ten or fewer. Mm -hmm. Just something where there's just enough food and they can have... I guess if a lion comes in, uh, all, they'll warn each other and and uh, wouldn't be hit killed by them. Yeah, and they um, so and also I think the mother daughter relationship, the oh. adult, ma the adult daughter, and the giraffe seem to have the mama <laughs> seem to hang around together as well. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you got that. Yeah, that's okay. really interesting how their families form. Do you want? Is Do you want me to say stuff or did you want it to come from Anne? Yeah, no, you're welcome to interject here too. Any any okay? bit of help is totally yeah, fine. Sometimes, sometimes I've forgotten yeah. and I've, tell, I've told Mary about it earlier and then she's remembered. Very annoying. And she remembers for you. If you're older. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but she can write it all down and pass it on to the rest of us so we can read about it too. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you have two sons as well, right? Two friends? Two sons. Oh, two sons, yes. Yes, they were. They are interested in animals really at all. No, not so Very much. Very depressing, really. <laughs> no. <laughs> My older son liked animals, but then he died a long time ago. So no, that was um, dad that passed Bonnie? away. Oh, you talking about your brother? Yeah, 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 yeah. Your brother Donald. Yeah, but um, Hugh and he and my two brothers. Um, even though we grew up, I mean, dad was a physicist mm -hmm. at, the, at the university, so he was a physics prof. Mom was in zoology. So of the three kids, I think um, one went on to do computer science. 
my other brother is a millwright, so he fixes mail sorting machines, and I, I'm an accountant. Ah. So it's like, you <laughs> didn't really follow, yeah, so science thing. Not so much. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> Who's going to carry on the legacy? <laughs> Well, my Mar- my um, daughter is, is coming, is doing a magnificent job. She came to the second time we went to Africa to have the, mo- to do the movie, and she got quite involved with Giraffe as well. And now she's working full time and she's an accountant. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, you can describe yourself. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my uh, if I had to pick my favorite animal, it would be a cat. <laughs> um, but, and I love all these cats. I love cats. Um, but I'm starting to like giraffes. <laughs> I'm getting to understand them a lot more. I think I was so used to growing up with giraffes everywhere that it was, you know, it was just, oh yeah, there's giraffes everywhere. But cats, cats are where it's at. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Like big cats or, or house cats? You know what? I love them all. Yeah. I've probably had, I think I counted last 10, 10 or 15 cats throughout my life. You know, that I've either had and they've passed away or something happened to them or what have you. But yeah, that's always been my passion are the cats. That's interesting. Do you have a second favorite animal, Anne? I'm oh, camels, eh? Oh, yeah, camels, really. I spent uh, two summers studying camels and that worked really well. I, a woman from Germany was, was um, working with them each summer and she said I could come along. And my husband took the two children off or three children off to somewhere else. So I was, um, had over two uh, months to work on camels and we, uh, made a book about that, which got got a distinctive something rather. Got an award. Yeah. Yeah. For a science award. Yeah. Cause you were in North in this time, instead of being in the Southern part of Africa, this was more more Northwest Africa. So in the Sahara desert. So yeah, mom went out in the middle of the summer to study (laughs) Study camels Ooh. in the Sahara Desert. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, yeah, that was rough. <laughs> Did you find any interesting similarities in your studies with giraffes and camels? Anything in particular uh, no, that, that? Not really. I was hoping there would be some, but they really, they both walk and they both eat. But that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, giraffes move in a really unique way from what I've read that you have written anyway about how their gait is very different from any other animal. So I'm guessing camels completely different the way that they walk versus the gait of a giraffe too. Yeah. And they walk really quite slowly because, because it's just so very hot there. And um, mm. but they're very interesting. And we walked right with them and slept in tents right beside them. It was, it was really fun. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> How many books have you written now? Well, I think 32. We just wow. did another, we released another two. Because <laughs> she's got, <laughs> there's a number of books that you had published through various different university presses. Mm-hmm. And then a number of books that you did through Otter Press, which was back in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And now we're finding with all the interest with mom is we're Dr. Dag, whatever. Uh, we're mm-hmm. starting to do um, more, publish a lot of the books that, weren't terrible people were sort of interested in back then but now that there's a resurgence in mom we're starting to put more and more books and have them available uh, for people to read excellent yeah. and we're creating a, a couple of compendiums as well because not only books but i don't know how mother raised the three of us to be honest because she's got so <laughs> much material i'm just like what the hell um <laughs> but we have enough to do we think three standalone compendiums, one about women and feminism, one about animals, and the third short stories. And uh, and now oh. we're looking at another one because there's it's either a story or a poem or a play and just putting them all together under these themes. And then we're in the process mm-hmm. of launching them as books too. So it just keeps coming and coming. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, because there's a lot of people out there that really want to consume that information. So the more you put out, that's awesome. People like me really want to get our hands on it and just read as much as possible and really take all that knowledge in. 
<laughs> so that's fantastic that you're still going with that. And so you have quite an interesting mix of topics too. You have all of this animal behavior work. You know, I know you, you, you taught, um, you've taught multiple different types of classes when it comes to zoology and animal behavior, but then you have this feminism, feminism side as well, where you've talked about all these different social injustices and, um, and have written in particular for gender equality because you yourself have faced quite, quite the amount of adversity, especially when it comes to your career. So what would you say the mix is between your animal sciences and your social sciences as far as your published books? Well, I, I guess... I, I guess the main, main interest was always behavior. I don't because if you a lot of people think, well, if they kill an animal, they can look at how many you know books or legs and and anyway, I would never kill an animal. So it had to be behavior, and and nobody else was really interested in that at the time. So I'd send them off to various some um, publishers, and they usually were quite happy to publish them. So I find I had over thirty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I would say it's some probably been back when you came back from Africa. So you would have come back in the fifties and then in the sixties, you and dad got married and had the three of us. And then when you went and started looking for a professional job in the seventies at a lot of universities, when you couldn't get a job, so they would either say, um, yeah, you know, we'll hire a man who, you know, he's got a family, maybe you don't. I think one thing that affected mom was she was married to a professor. So their view was, well, you're a married woman. You need to leave jobs available for men because they need the men to, you know, to support their families. Like oh. this kind of, you know, you'd never hear that today, thank God. But back then, it no, was the a, traditionalism a standard back then, comment, yeah. right? You're, you know, you're married. So stay home and raise your babies. <laughs> Um, oh, and then at that point, that, that, was that frustrates me to the good. core. I can only imagine <laughs> living through that. Just yeah. hearing about it is almost, almost elicits just such an anger because it's such a misunderstanding and misrepresentation and a belittlement of females everywhere not to be able to fill those roles that they're, you know, meant to fill and, and really reserving those places for a man. It's, yeah, it's really frustrating. I cannot imagine what it was like to kind of live through that <laughs> era. And, you know, other countries still experience stuff like oh, that. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. still very much prevalent. Yeah, still very mm -hmm. much, yeah. Yeah, and, and interesting enough, when we went through the film festivals and uh, the number of people, so we traveled through Canada and we went to Los Angeles and to New York as well until, and then COVID hit. But when we were doing the film festivals, pretty well every single time someone would come up and say to mom, you know, I experienced the same thing. I was trying to get into vet school in the 1970s and they said, we only have 10% of the spots available for women, 90 for the men. <laughs> Your marks are good, but you don't make it within the 10%. So sorry about that. And Although then these you, women's career went, <laughs> they never got a chance. But they often you had know? a lot better, did a lot better than the men. Yeah. Been, the men oh. were usually worse than the women. Yeah. Because they, you know, they needed to be in order to get ahead. So, because I think you've been very lucky. Well, think about how much that's dumbing down the pool and dumbing down the, the population and, and the, just the intelligence level because you're not picking the person that's the best fit. You're just picking based on gender. And that really dilutes everything, I feel well, like. Oh, yeah. It's, it's just really, really, really annoying. <laughs> and when you think of all the things you could have learned about giraffes, yeah. if you'd been given a chance, yeah. every, summer, every summer you could have gone over, come back, done more publications, not just but giraffe, but rhinos, elephants, all those creatures. And if you just take your story and extrapolate it, it's amazing how much information we don't have. That knowledge was not, not enhanced, not developed. These mm -hmm. people never got a chance. So, I mean, mom was lucky. Yeah, and like, how many women yeah. have been in that position as well? Mm -hmm. Exactly. How many other female explorers out there never actually got the opportunity or the chance because of being held back because of reasons like that? Well, you have a family or you have a husband. Yeah. And so they're denied those opportunities. Yep. <laughs> yep. But you made it through, Anne. But I think you got through it anyway. When her, you shoot, I think your focus really went into women at that point. Yeah. And said, and that was really about 30 years of just book after book about, <laughs> we're going through them all now. <laughs> Harems and other horrors. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're great titles. <laughs> um, that is an awesome <laughs> title. I love that. 50% <laughs> Solution, which is about women being, you know, one of the things I did. When I was a kid, mom would say, let's go to a gallery. And I'd be like, oh, okay, we're going to look at the pictures. And mom's like, no, no, we're not looking at pictures. We're just seeing 
whether the picture was painted by a man or a woman. And then we go through one by one. Ah. If we weren't sure, if it was like a name like Robin, which could be either one, we just put that in unknown. And then at the end of it, she's like, true oh, scientist, we're only women. And then she'd fight with the, with the city. We need more women. <laughs> and there's people would say, what was the artwork like? I'm like, I don't know. We were just, we weren't actually looking at the <laughs> But I think it really became the total science driven mind oh, totally. there for sure. Collecting all that data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think um, one could say that even though you could look at it as missed opportunity, you know, that 30 year span or period of time where you weren't able to return to Africa and study giraffes, you did so many other wonderful, valuable things and really kind of led the charge when it came to women understanding that they're important and they matter and their careers matter as well. And the path that they want to choose also matters and there's value to that. And so I think um, even though it's maybe not what you know you originally had in mind as this person who wanted to study behavior in the field, your life took such an interesting turn to be able to motivate and inspire so many other women to feel like they had the power to be able to do what they wanted to do with their life, not necessarily what society says they should be doing with their life. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry you didn't get to go back to Africa, but I'm so glad that you got to do the things <laughs> that you did get to do in the meantime, prior to returning, because it's huge. Yeah, I think it made a huge, huge difference. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, just uh, the fact that the, uh, the, of getting this movie out was um, very unlikely, really, because I remember saying when the, the um, woman doing it wanted me to talk to go to Africa with her and to have a movie. And I said, well, you know, I'm not really part important. It's the drafts that are important. And then, and then when I saw the movie, I realized that wasn't going to be true. And it was so much better. It was just, it was just magnificent, really. Yeah. I, because I was in you, they, all the things I worried about that there they were and huge. <laughs> yeah. And interestingly enough, um, Ali was, so Al Alison Reed is the filmmaker and she's really the one who had the vision. And uh, we, I think it took about five years to make the documentary. And um, at the time when she approached mom, it was just like, let's do a book, uh, let's do a movie about you. And mom's like, no, no, why don't we just do it about giraffes? And they're like, no, let's do it about you and giraffes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, and of course, when I got in and sucked in, I thought it was the best thing in the whole world to be <laughs> in a movie yeah. with giraffes. <laughs> Well, the thing, Anne, though, is that somebody like you can pull people in that might not otherwise be interested or understand the problem that giraffe are facing as well with, you know, coming, being so endangered and so threatened as a species. And so having you who's so passionate about them and all of the wonderful experiences that you've had can, can humanize that to a certain extent and bring more people to understanding and to be interested in seeing what's going on with giraffe just because you're a part of that. So anybody can make a movie about giraffes and um, you know, and, and people who are interested in giraffe are going to watch that, but people who aren't might not, but bringing the human element to it and, and putting you at the forefront of that, I think is going to pull in even more people to want to learn more and to kind of, you know, sympathize with you and um, hopefully become more a part of the, the solution to the problem that we're seeing with these declining populations of giraffe as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I'm sure you're right. At just the time, I, I just thought, since that had been ignored my whole life, why would it change? And then it, it changed mm -hmm. <laughs> because she had the, the the brilliance to to take these two things, giraffe and what had happened to me at universities, and put them together. It made a huge difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It really did. It came together very nicely and was really an interesting story from start to finish. So yeah, I think, I think it's, I, I certainly hope that anybody listening here is going to, is going to watch the doc as well, because it was very enlightening. Oh, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Are you planning any trips back to Africa anytime soon? Uh, well, actually we went last year and we got, when we came home, it, the COVID started that really week. So um, I've had a whole year of COVID, but before that, my son came and, and, the, and the filmmaker, and we had a wonderful, about, I guess, three weeks. You were there about four weeks. Four yeah. weeks, yeah. Yeah, in uh, weeks. Kenya. In, in Kenya this time. Yeah. So um, Lovely. maybe get some footage out of that somehow. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's just shot. I'll be interested to see what comes out on her face <laughs> driving in the Jeep. <laughs> oh, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have a smile on my face just even thinking about that. I have never been to Africa. The only giraffe I've ever seen are at zoos. Yeah. And, you know, of course, every zoo I visit that has a giraffe, I'm the first one in line that wants to feed the giraffe. You know, <laughs> I, I have to be a part of the hands-on experience. I want to get up and close. I've been known to throw a tantrum or two when the feeding enclosures are closed and you can't get that personal experience. <laughs> so where, where if, if you're giving advice to someone like myself who's never been to Africa to see Giraffe in the Wild, where would you tell them to go to experience it for themselves? Because I know they have all these different tourist areas set up and these farms and other areas, but where would you guide people if they really want to go watch and see these animals in their in their own environment and observe their behavior as well. May, may, what is the name of the big farm? Uh, there's one in Kenya. There's a number, uh, Kenya and probably South Africa. Yeah, South Africa, where I was, I loved especially, but um, we're, we're getting a lot of, uh, giving a lot of money to uh, what, which, which country? Uh, uh, Tanzania as well. Tanzania, yeah. yeah and so we're um, involved with, right now we're involved with um, draft and how they're looking after them right now. So, um, yeah, they're doing, the populations are doing quite well. Everything's relative. Uh, it's oh, good. Africa, Eastern part. There's Kruger National Park, which is phenomenal. That was very near where we lived. Yeah. So this is sort of the north mm -hmm. part of South Africa. But there are a whole bunch of smaller parks all throughout um, South Africa and all throughout the country, actually. But there's uh, good populations of giraffe in South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, um, West Africa, not at all. They're really, really struggling. The populations there, um, a lot of civil unrest, oh, yeah. and Niger, Chad, they're, they're yeah. in really, really rough shape. Um, I, and is that, is that tied to hunger as well? Are you finding that they're getting killed for meat or yeah? what's the biggest yeah. concern for the population? It's, it's sort of a combination of things. I think, uh, the biggest part really has to do with their habitat. So with larger human populations, that's encroaching on their land and their space. So there's not as much room for them to just be free and wild. And uh, a lot of um, some civil, un civil unrest happening in some countries, a lot of uh, civil wars. And uh, also, if the particular countries has a lot of unemployment, for example, with COVID, a lot of the parks don't have the tourism dollars coming in from all around the world. A lot of people come from the US, for example, and people would be hired as a ranger or a guide. Um, a lot of those positions, they were laid off. So if it's hard to get a job and you see an elephant, or sorry, you see a giraffe wandering around or even an elephant, and you think, well, if I could shoot it, then you know there's free food for myself and my family and, and other people. So there's that pressure on them as well, uh, which is for bush meat. And then also there is an element of trophy hunting, um, especially in certain parts of South Africa. Unfortunately, you can still go online and pay, I think it's 3,500 pounds. This is out of the UK uh, to go and shoot a giraffe and they will guarantee you, you get a giraffe. And it, it sort of boggles my mind. I, I'm so against guns and all that stuff, but to shoot a giraffe of all things, like it's, it's yeah. being a, a, a fish in a bucket. Like what's the point? <laughs> you know, it's just wanting, it's not going to hurt yeah. anybody. It's just walking around doing whatever giraffes do. Like it's just mind blowing, but that's also putting a lot of pressure on uh, animals in the wild too. Well, and with such declining populations, it, it absolutely is mind boggling to me that anyone finds it entertaining or fun to kill things just to kill things. Like I can understand wanting to feed your family, you know, if you're starving and along comes something that you can eat and nourish your family with, but to just kill an animal for the sport of it, I, I, I don't understand the psychology behind that. I'll just say that. I don't understand how that's even legal. I understand that it brings money to the economy in a certain sense, but there are so many other ways to bring money to the economy and you can't bring the drafts back once they're gone. So yeah, yeah it's just something I've not ever quite understood. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of right now, um, I think there's 12 states that have actually gotten together and banned the importation of endangered species into their states. They're trying to get it so they can do it at a federal level, so it's all of the U.S. But at this point, 
there's 12 states who have gone and said, as a state, we will not allow you to import giraffe ports or also, you know, whether the ivory or rhino or any of that stuff. We don't want any of that stuff in our state. We don't want to be part of the problem, which is great. So, Do you know who's working on that legislation right now? Is it one of the larger conservancy groups or who's who's helping with that? Yeah, there is one organization and I think it's called the World Animal Protection and there, uh, I know in New York, it has one of the strongest legislations brought out by um, Cuomo, and he came out. And actually, I can send you this information if you like. He came out with some really strong stuff, and it's passed in the state of New York. We want nothing to do with that. And then they've used that similar process for 12 other states. And now they sort of approach different states and try and figure out how do we get in front of the state legislature to at least prevent for our states. Certain states were no are not going to happen. <laughs> we can try, but they're more yeah. tend to be more about the trophy hunting, um, more so in this southern part of this of the U.S. Um, but I can certainly say <laughs> yeah. information. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. You can call them out. It's okay. Texas. <laughs> Florida, <laughs> Texas is the word. Texas. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's send you a link for that because there's uh, information there. And if you do get, you know, some people from a certain state who say, how can we get our state on board? I think Vermont may be the most recent state. So it's phenomenal what's happening. Mm. But I'll send you a couple of links. Well, I will definitely include that for sure. Let me have that information. I'll put that in the show notes to the podcast so people can get on board with that and follow that because I love to put information in these as to how people can get involved and actually help. Not just hearing about the problem, but getting involved with the solution. Yes, yeah, that, that would be, be fantastic. Wonderful. If we can stop the demand, then people aren't going to kill them anymore. Or they're not, you know, if nobody's going to come over, what's the point of having them available? And they'll find some other work. Um, and so you, you've started a foundation as well. Is that correct? Yes. This is, this is um, I guess, she, Mary's in charge of it. So, <laughs> Yeah. We found that when we traveled around with the movie, people would come up to us and say, how can I help? Like, what can I do? Mm -hmm. And we realized that people were, they had a passion for giraffes, but they more really, really had a passion for, for Dr. Dag, for Anne, because a lot of people when they watch it, they can kind of see themselves in different parts of mom's life. And they really sort of resonated and said, you know, what happened to you was terrible. You know, we got to do something about this. So we thought, you know what, let's take this interest. Let's start a foundation. Let's put it in your name. So it's actually the Anne Innes Dag Foundation. And uh, the whole idea behind the foundation is about giraffe and giraffe conservation. But it's also around women empowerment. It's also around encouraging Africans themselves. Um, the last thing we want to do is be sort of one of those white, you know, we're coming in as white people and telling the Africans yeah, how to yeah. run their animals. That's not what we're about at all. We want to help the locals. We want to help them get engaged, employ them, whatever it is we can do to help fight the what's happening and, and however we can do with our solutions. So we've started that foundation, um, been enormously successful. We've had um, all around the world, we seem to, I think last thing we had about 16 or 17 different countries going on and checking our foundation from Japan and Korea and England and all these sort of countries <laughs> like, how do they know about us? But it's great. And uh, from there, we've started something called the Junior Giraffe Club, and that is gauged and targeted at kids. Our focus is the ages 7 to 17-ish, we're flexible, uh, and we have a number of facilitators um, who are, um, a couple of them are university students, so we wanted to sort of have a, you know, the younger and the goal there is to take kids that love giraffes and learn more about giraffes. So we've now, uh, we started at the beginning of this year, we've had four meetings. Um, the nice thing about the Junior Giraffe Club, we have about 25 members from five different countries. We've got Canada, we've got members from the US, we have Florida, Washington State, a couple from New York. And uh, uh, yeah, and then we have some from England, a couple from Tanzania. We just picked up another guy from Jamaica. So we're trying to eventually go global with this. And our objective really is around some reason press and people seem to listen to kids um and sometimes the message is everybody's heard the message before they get it you know the earth is in trouble we need to do things and after a while you kind of tune out the adults but when a kid says it people sort of pay more attention and we think you know what let's get our kids interested and let's get them to be the voice the next 
generation, if you will. So we've, uh, in connection with the movie, we've had all of these zookeepers, wildlife vets know about Anne. So we ended up with our very first session. We had the Toronto Zoo zookeeper. He came on, I don't know if you remember from the movie, Jason Pudelow, who was looking up the vagina <laughs> of this portrait. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Carrying on a casual conversation with his arm up a vagina. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. Just, you know, talking tea over coffee with my arm in a giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> so he graciously came on and met with the club members and talked about this is how I became a zookeeper. And then we had another individual who specializes in training, similar to what you do, but he works with wild animals. Uh, he works with animals in captivity rather than with dogs. Um, and he is all about permission. So I loved it when we were reading your bio, you talk, you never do punishment. That's not what you're about. And no. this guy- mm -mm. On, Cooperative care all the way. Right. And this guy came on, he's based Six Flags, I think in San Francisco. And he says, he is all about working with them so that they feel like they are making choices to participate in certain activities. So for example, he had a giraffe, which had a, a bad knee and he had to figure out because giraffes are not used to being touched ever. So he had to figure out how do I get close enough so someone can examine the knee, maybe give some shots with the needle. And he worked through that whole process, fascinating stuff. He worked through all that process about allowing the giraffe to give the giraffe has the permission. So it's not like you're forcing the giraffe. I need to look at your knee, come here. The giraffe would do its own activity, make its own movement, and then you would meet it. So it's all about the draft being part of it rather than being dominated, if you will. He was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And then he ended up getting... It is so much safer to build trust in an animal and have that cooperative care. It, it, I mean, the safety is just immeasurable compared to forcing animals into things that they don't want to do that elicits fear. Yeah, when you, when you take the time and you slow things down and you build trust with that animal because you're giving them the power of choice, it, it's such a safer practice in general and it's just better for everybody. Yes, yes, and he actually is so, uh, so engaged in it. He actually took a part of the giraffe's coat pattern and had it tattooed on his arm. <laughs> and he actually does it with whatever animal he's working with. He's working with a blind wolf. So he took, you know, he was able to get Close enough, he apparently tried a hundred times to get this wolf to take a needle in the eye and eventually figured it out. And he had a big tattoo of a wolf on his arm. Like he's phenomenal. I could talk about him all day. So he ended up coming to one of our Oh, somebody I'd love to meet. Yeah. Yeah. He is oh, I love Kyle is his name. I love Kyle. Um and then um another session we had with uh our most recent session, we had one of our members is actually a third year zoology student at West Virginia University. And she is a budding giraffologist. So we said, Tell us your journey. Why did you want to become that? So this is great because Kids, when they're, you know, teenagers relate more to kids that are at university. So they were asking good questions. Well, how did you do, how did you do that? And they, there's a great relationship there. And now we've hooked up with another organization that funds, um, he's a, it's a, a guy named Dr. John. He's based in South Africa, Pretoria University. And uh, he actually does wildlife vet. So if an animal, he specifically started out with rhinos. And if a rhino is found injured in the field, then they use their fundraising, get a helicopter, fly out, do whatever medical help they want to make sure that this uh, animal survives. And we contacted them and said, he said, yeah, we do, we do a lot of giraffes, unfortunately, because they get caught in these snares. Mm -hmm. A lot of the local people will set up snares, not necessarily targeting giraffes, but maybe they want a deer or something, but the giraffe just eats the same stuff and then gets caught in these snares. Um, and they recently had a case where the snare, uh, the lower part of the hoof of this one giraffe had to be removed. Oh. So they had to fly out and see if they can help out. And, you know, so that this giraffe, I think it was just a young baby could sort of continue its life. Um, so we're hoping to bring him on. So it's, it's all real world stuff. So we're very excited about our junior giraffe program, which is also sort of under the umbrella of the foundation. <laughs> so we got lots of stuff going on. That's really lots cool. Lots of stuff. Yeah. 
So what about, um, do you do hands-on work with volunteers uh, through the foundation? Like if you have a group of volunteers that actually go to Africa and help out in the field or are kind of boots on the ground in Canada or in the U.S., do you have anybody that's doing kind of hands-on stuff from a volunteer perspective? We don't actually do that with our foundation. Uh, The view is more that we're sort of a conduit um, to sponsor other programs. So we may have um, ability to go out and sponsor other things, but we wouldn't actually offer that within the foundation. So we've partnered with a lot of other boots on the ground, like the Saving the Survivors group with the um, Wildlife Vet. They're on the ground in South Africa. We would raise money for giraffe and then they would go out and do the work. Um, Same with Wild Nature Institute, which is based in Tanzania. Their focus is doing a lot of research on, I think they have a herd of over 4,000 giraffe and they're doing spot patterns and understanding how they work together and the female male and oh, a whole bunch of stuff. So again, we raise money to sponsor them. Um, we have another woman um, who we provided funding for the Dr. Ann Innesdag education coordinator who's based in Tanzania. Uh, a local African, and she, I think, has her master's degree. No, she has a PhD. No. Oh, she has a PhD. Oh, great. Oh. Uh, so she travels around, meets with kids, uh, then takes them in buses and takes them out to actually see giraffes. A lot of these Tanzanian kids have never seen a giraffe. Um, you know, they have very poor upbringings, and it's not like they're wandering around. You actually have to go to sort of parks to see them. So we raise funding so we can pay for these van trips. Uh, educational materials to teach the kid planting trees um, so that there can be more trees down the road, (laughs) all those kinds of things. Um, So we sort of look for a really good initiative and then reach out to these organizations and say, how can we fund that? Okay. Interesting. So um, a lot of people now, I run a nonprofit organization, so this comes up quite frequently. How do you know which organizations to support and which ones not to necessarily? A lot of people are very concerned about where their dollars are going and if they're actually being applied in the field directly to support and help these animals. So you mentioned Wild Nature Institute and Saving Survivors. Are there other organizations that you as a foundation support that you know are legitimate and are actively helping out in the field? Uh, There's another organization we work with called um, African Wildlife Foundation, and that is actually mostly based in uh, Washington, D.C. They do have some arms in other organizations as well, and they are definitely boots on the ground. That is their MO, uh, their mandate. So one thing we've done is they have a bunch of sniffer dogs. So when animals are shot and they try and ship either their body parts or the meat um, out to different countries, in the airports, they have all these sniffer dogs and they would sniff it out. And the sniffer dogs are trained on um, elephant tusks, elephant meat, rhinos, but they weren't trained on giraffes because no one was really worried about giraffes. Ah. So he said, can we give you some money? I think it ended up being about $5,000 can you then train these dogs to sniff out giraffe meat as well? Excellent. So they've added that to their list, <laughs> which is great. And, you know, Wonderful. and it was, again, using dogs, because I know your passion is dogs. Um, so I just decided what I'm going to do with my dog next. We're going to train her <laughs> to sniff out exotics. You just gave me my next task. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, are we going to do search and rescue next? Maybe bed bugs? Nope. This is exactly what we're going to do. (laughs) And then another really great organization we work with is the World Animal Protection Organization, which is much more about legislative changes. Um, So, for example, we're working with them. um, We're trying to put pressure on our prime minister, which, you know, equivalent kind of your president. We have a prime minister. And um, the source of COVID is from wildlife. So if you go back to SARS and look at all those other diseases that came, it's coming from wildlife and humans are encroaching on their space. So what we're trying to do is lobby the government to say, we have to put legislation in so we're not importing this wildlife into the country and people are leaving the wildlife wild because as much as everybody's like, wow, we can see the other side of the corner. We're almost done with COVID. Everybody's going to have their vaccine. 
you know, it'll be another hundred years before we have another big pandemic. No, <laughs> this could be happening anytime. Yeah. Like they're continuing to get into a lot of these creatures, which are not part of sort of a, like if you eat chickens or cows or pork or whatever, which have all been well tested and for human consumption, this, these animals are not designed for that. And um, when human beings continue to encroach into them, this is how these pandemics may start. So we're trying to lobby our Canadian government to say, you need to stop exotics from being brought into the country. And we need to do that right away. We don't want another pandemic happening on our hands. And one of the things that, as I understand it, the G20, which is happening in Italy, um, hopefully over, I think it's over this summer, that that's on their list. They're saying to all the countries around the globe, we can't just sit back and say, yay, we're done. Everybody's got their vaccine. Let's get back to normal. No, we need to really think, how do we prevent another one from happening? Yeah, prevention is key. We can't just sit back and be, you know, be reactive to everything that comes our way. This is the perfect moment in time to say, okay, we know this yeah. is going to happen again. What can we do about it? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like you raise, that's a very good point because it's kind of like, when do you raise this topic? Because people are kind of like, oh, I don't want to hear it about it anymore. Like, I just got to get through my life. I got to deal with my kids. Like, I, I don't want to hear about it. But then once everybody's had their vaccine and gone back to their regular life or, you know, whatever it looks like post pandemic, then nobody wants to talk about it anymore. I don't want to talk about it anymore. So it's, yeah. it's kind of like we have to get that message when people are feeling pain <laughs> mm -hmm. and then saying, their respective governments, we have to figure out how we can prevent this happening again. Yeah, get through that COVID fatigue. We're going to have to get over that COVID yeah. fatigue hump to be able to prevent the next thing that comes our way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I love learning about all these different organizations and especially how your foundation is supporting them. It's good to know that you're out there kind of vetting these different groups and supporting what they're doing and knowing that people who support your foundation, where their money is going, I think that's really helpful. So I'll definitely include a link there too so people can get involved. I love this junior program idea. This is fantastic, getting the youth getting the youth started early on. Um, that's that's beautiful. So I'm gonna put that in there too. If you're looking for more members, that is, to oh, join absolutely. that club. Absolutely. Excellent. We would love that. <laughs> we'll you know, that. and it's a good point is too about making sure you vet the organizations. And the lucky thing is that anytime that we decide to work with one, we reach out to the people in the draft community saying, do you know these people? So before we reached out to Saving Our Survivors, which is this vet, wildlife vet, um, we reached out to a guy, Francis Deacon, who's in the movie. And we said, do you know these guys? Like, are they legit? And he's like, yeah, I know them. I see them. They're out there. They're saving rhinos. They're doing elephants. Perfect. Okay. But you do, I would strongly encourage anybody be do your research if you you know you could have this amazing looking website and lots of great pictures and everything else but make sure you know where your money is going and it's not just going to admin and uh and have a conversation do a bit of a google search like whatever you need to do make sure it is all on the up and up yeah there are i mean even as a child i i started volunteering at a zoo when i was 12 years old and i was so excited about it and i got i just threw myself deep into it and i wanted to join all these, you know, the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Federation and all these different groups. And, you know, so I was always bugging my parents to send my allowance to these different organizations and I'd get their stickers back in the mail. And, you know, at that age, you have zero idea where anything is going or what anybody is doing. You just get very excited about you being able to potentially help other animals that you can't even put your eyes or your hands on. And the older you get and the more you look into these different things and even watching, you know, documentaries, like, I don't know if you've seen Sea Spiracy or even Cowspiracy, some of these larger organizations, there is a lot of admin. And I'm not saying admin isn't necessary. I know it very much is. But when you look at the proportion of the funds that are actually being put into practice, into the field, into actual conservation practices, it can be pretty staggering. So yeah, I definitely love that you guys are, are, are doing some vetting and looking for reputation ahead of time before actually bringing anybody on board and saying, yes, we're going to support you. And yes, we're going to help fund your programs as well. I think that's huge. Yeah. And one of the things we've committed to in our foundation, thanks to my mother, is that <laughs> she's going to cover all the administration costs and any money that is brought in by a donor goes directly 100% through to whatever activity we're sponsoring. Maybe that is beautiful. That makes like, such a you huge difference. That? <laughs> yeah. I never was <laughs> Yes. 
You know, and most charities are not that lucky. I know Charity Water operates the same way. They have a private donor that covers their administrative costs, so they can say 100% of their donations go directly to help with clean water. Um, but a lot of organizations don't have that that luxury, so that is so fantastic that you've done that, Anne, because that takes such a burden off of the organization, and it really increases the amount of donations that you receive because people really want to know where their dollars are going. And so that that's huge. I mean, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yep. And, and there is a, a giraffe group that actually has killed animals and sold them to um, people that need meat. And, and what? Uh, one has to be really careful not to have anything to do with him. Yeah. But his name is... Oh, can you tell us who him is? Who's him? We're supposed to say. Um, I'm not, I don't want to get into involved with him because... Of what I will do is forward you an article uh, that was written about him. Okay. But... Um, Okay. In there, he who shall not be named, kind of in, <laughs> in bed, if you will, with some of these trophy hunters. Um, okay. With giraffes, because some areas are the population is okay, and other areas the population mm -hmm. is is incredibly low. That some people will say, "Oh, well, the population is okay, then we need to do some conservation efforts, and maybe there's too many giraffes." So if that's the case, mm. then why don't I bring over Hunter A from whatever country and we'll kill some of the drafts and we're actually doing it on behalf of conservation. It's whenever they, you know, mm. too many. What about all the mm. trees that they're eating? Like this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah. So we will send that to you. We'll send you an article and then it's up to you to kind of digest it and, and figure out how you want to pass along. To and do with it what, what I will. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, make yes, a note about that. Absolutely. I, I'm very interested to learn about that. And I think it's really important for people to actually know what they're supporting, what they're not. There's so many good people out there with good intentions that really want to help and have no idea that, you know, when they send that check over, that it could be supporting something that they're completely against. So yeah, I would love to read that article. Please definitely send that to me. I'll I'll um I'll dissect that and and make sure it's not tied to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I put it out there. <laughs> Yeah. He was not named. <laughs> he was not named. <laughs> well, um, I want to swing back into behavior just a little bit because, you know, I'm an animal behavior nut, of course. Um, but I, I would love to learn just a little bit about some of the behaviors that during your time observing and even just in your time now, and the more you go back and the more you learn about giraffe, what some of your favorite, most fascinating behaviors that you've learned about them are? Well, I think... Um... In fact, it doesn't seem interesting, but um, I, I noticed that males would sometimes um, uh, mount, mount on males, and I, and, I, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, wow, that's really interesting. And then when I got into the um, actually working with, I found that there were a number of people that didn't want to really say that this was happening. <laughs> But that it was happening, and um, I, 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 I've been working about that ever since because um, there's so, so many people are against people that are in the in the like. Well, you explained it about people the homosexuals. Are, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the big arguments mm -hmm. people have against people who are homosexual is it's not natural. It doesn't happen in the natural world. Shouldn't happen in people world. Hmm. We're saying no. <laughs> Those are not biologists. Not true. <laughs> Not true, and I think those people are not biology majors right. or zoology majors <laughs> or ethology majors. <laughs> and I think that was something that you noticed when you were out there. And I think when you brought it forward to Mr. Matthew or other people, you know, they would say, "Oh, we won't, well, we won't talk about that." But uh, and, then I uh, got um, thinking about. I mean, this is really important because there are a lot of homosexual people, and now they're treated really badly. Let's just say. Uh, this happens in pretty well all animals. Yeah, of course. And, um, yeah. So I'm, I'm writing an article right now about <laughs> about this. Um, yeah, you published an article in the mid 70s yeah, about witnessing this homosexual behavior, and it was really, I think, one of the first articles that I had come so. out because you know a lot of you know you, you know a lot of the people was a lot of old views about what homosexual <laughs> was and all this stuff, and I think there was a lot of fear for bringing out articles and people would say, then, what the heck? Yeah, and, and, and um, human beings will be ruined because because there are no more children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, it really is interesting. Notice. Look at things. I mean, in, 
you kind of brought to the forefront the the word that I love to use all the time, which is anthropomorphization, because people have these human characteristics that they put onto animals, expecting them to display human-like behaviors. And even in situations where they are displaying some human-like behaviors, they're still like, no, 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 that's not, that's not natural. That's not right. Um, and that's not a human behavior, but it is a human behavior and it is other species related behaviors as well. There's so many species out there that will actually even flip flop between males and females, just depending on, you know, various different situations in the environment. And we've got to make people realize that this is common. It's, it's in pretty, I I wrote a paper about it and I had really scores of animals in which I had, that I read about this happening. So, um, I think it's very important for people in the future. I think a lot of it too is that people are so sheltered. They don't really realize what is natural and what is wild. I mean, you have creatures out there that, you know, parasitize other creatures by, you know, paralyzing them and laying eggs in them so their babies can eat them from the inside out. And, you know, in mating rituals, you know, lots of females will bite off the heads of the males and kill them right after mating or the males will die after. There's all these things that happen in the natural world that is completely normal and but but to the average human that isn't exposed to any of that you know we're, we live in this sheltered little bubble like even even meat production you know i'm an omnivore i eat meat as well it's all humane raised food but we're so used to these little perfectly packaged items we have no idea what part of the body it even came from because we're so sheltered from nature itself so i i kind of love that that you brought that it's wonderful that you you've noticed that because yeah. most people don't really go that deep yeah, they don't. They don't want to know about it, really. <laughs> yeah, no, they don't. And I find I find it fascinating to learn more and more. And other people are like, "Oh, no, 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 I don't want to know about that." <laughs> yeah, just... but to understand other animals is to understand ourselves too. Oh, yeah. So it's interesting that people want to put that wall up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Did you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the males with their necks as well? Oh, and... well, uh, yeah. Well, they did. They did have. Um, Hitting each other with uh, their horn, their um, osicorns, and uh, then they then they would mate as well. Sometimes, anyway. So I, I did bring that forward. That was an unusual behavior. Well, no, not a, not unusual because I, but just an interesting behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wanted people to take it in and think, well, if animals can do it, then it's not unnatural. Mm-hmm. And I think in some of the cases, it was always two males that were yeah having that i don't remember behavior. two females right but the females do have osicombs but yeah but yeah i, I i'm never sure why i never saw any draft doing that and and i haven't read about it in much or at all in the general but that it is so the females wouldn't participate you never saw a female or i've never heard of it actually a female no with that they think it's sort of hormonal related that two men are or two males maybe fighting Oh well, yeah, whichever that, that's, strongest is going to mate with the female. Yeah, that, and that's kind of idea happen often. Yeah, well, maybe always. I don't know, but <laughs> some of them, when you if you watch on YouTube, you can hear boom and you see blood, and it you know it can get quite aggressive. <laughs> yeah, oh, even yeah. really violent. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And somehow the females find that ever so impressive. I guess, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I guess humans aren't much different, right? <laughs> oh, any other fun, fascinating behaviors that you um, that you think people should know more about when it comes to giraffe? Well, I guess uh, in terms of when babies are born, um, because <laughs> interestingly enough, with giraffes, um, there's been some studies when people say, "Well, how long is the gestation period?" And it's actually between 14 months and 16 months, and people are like, "Well," Like human beings, people always say nine months, but in drafts, it can fluctuate up to two to three months. And part of that is if the conditions aren't that good, so the food isn't maybe that great, or there's a lot of lions around or some reason that mom doesn't want to give birth right away, she can actually delay the birth up to two months before she says, okay, conditions are much better. Now I'm going to have a baby. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's fairly new research that's come out. That's wonderful. And of course, baby, as soon as it's born, the first thing it does, falls six feet, hits the ground. <laughs> and there was a group of uh, giraffologists, I believe in one of the states in the U.S., who said, you know, this poor giraffe is sort of welcome to the world. And then you hit the ground. So Bam. Thought, maybe we should do some sort of net 
underneath it. So when baby came out, this net would be there and, you know, it'd be sort of a soft thing. And they found that the baby didn't do as well. It was kind of like it needed to hit the ground to sort of say, okay, now you're breathing air, get your lungs going, start (laughs) thinking about walking up, get out of the embryotic sac. Like, (laughs) yeah, that's fascinating. That was fascinating. And does that give you... does that make you twitch when you hear people trying to intervene like that, you know, coming from a behavior perspective and they're like, oh, let's put a net there. Are you just going, ah, <laughs> stop, don't intervene. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Did you just learn something new about the two to three months? That apparently with the gestation is period? relatively new. Yeah, interestingly. Yeah, enough, that's there's, crazy. There's not that many people out there studying giraffes in the wild. Um, elephants are right now, elephants and rhinos, everybody's all over. Um, but giraffes, for some reason, everybody knows a giraffe when you consider when you're a little baby. I mean, you know, I think if you ask any two year old, oh, there's a giraffe, (laughs) but, um, interesting enough, there's not that many people studying now. We're hoping to get more and more, but it's a relatively small community. So it means that there's not a ton of research happening. And the thing is, they're not that to study. You have to be in Africa. <laughs> you have to have a lot of time on your hands because you're just going to, a lot of money. You have to watch them walk around, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and for whatever reason, they haven't been on the, the radar so much as a subject to study. Um, so a lot of the results we're getting out um, are relatively new. Um, another one was how to draft communicate. So for a long time, when you saw them, I don't think you ever heard them. You ever never heard a sound. Well, I heard. No, I, heard I might have heard a sound, but I didn't know they, they say, communicated. Mm. But it was, you know, are they communicating? How's that working? And people kind of assumed it was just by eye. But they've now done more studies, and they found that they're using sound waves that humans can't hear. Similar with the dog, those dog whistles that dogs can hear, but humans can't. Mm-hmm. Same sort of idea. Also a different pitch or tone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And they sound, They found they had... Someone saw a giraffe on one side of a hill and another giraffe on another side of a hill. So they could not see each other, but they seemed to just with their movement of their head and they sort of one came over the hill to meet the other, that it seemed like they were somehow communicating. But again, (laughs) we we don't know. They're still doing a lot of research around it. (laughs) Um, because, you know, we- yeah, I'm curious, are they, like recording all of the sounds that are happening in the environment and then kind of breaking it down, you know, by each individual yeah, sound yeah. and what, what tone it's at yeah. and where it's coming from. That's really interesting. Right. So there's so much, we really don't know about them so much. Yeah. Well, that's really exciting actually, because it leaves so much open to explore, you know, to, to go out there and to seek and to study and to find. And, and, um, it, you know, it's, it's one of those things where people feel like we, we, we're at the point where we know everything about everything. And I hate that idea because I feel like you could, you could forever learn and not ever consume all of the information that is out there. And so for an animal like a giraffe to, to know that there's so much that we still don't know yet is really exciting. Yeah, um, that's really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, and hopefully as more, you know, scholarships come available and, you know, more universities will start funding programs, hopefully we can get more people out in the field because I bet that finances are really a big hurdle for most people, at least probably coming from the United States, you know, that aren't local to Africa and that it does require a lot of travel uh, because I can, I can easily see finances being the biggest barrier to research. Um, So, you know, I'm really hoping that, you know, some of the foundations and some of the universities will step it up to offer some scholarships to people that find interest in that field to be able to provide for those that are really serious about doing research in the field and kind of bringing that back to the masses so that we can better understand animals like giraffe to begin with. Yes, that would be phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's so very important, I think, especially for, from a conservation standpoint, because how can we really truly help if we don't fully understand them to begin with, you know, like the net, you know, the net is a perfect example. What if what we're doing is actually harmful versus helpful because we just don't have enough information. Yeah. It's happened in the past. Yeah. (laughs) I'll just make it easier. (laughs) Well, um, Anne, is there anything that you want to share with people out there that have a, a shared passion for draft and even even for um, for gender equality? You, you've been such a huge pioneer on the forefront of both topics, both subjects. So is there anything that you want to share with anyone that might be listening to this about how they can get involved more um, and kind of continue in their path and in their journey? 
Well, well, I guess um, even if we got in touch with one of us, we we could tell them, you know, about how where to go, really, mm -hmm. because we now we now both know pretty well all the animals that, and there is one particular person that is doing negative things about giraffe, which we can't mention, but we don't we don't want anyone ever to have to deal with this person who has killed a number. Yep, we're going to send that to uh, to Sarah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I good. I'm not. I'm not sure whether you have. I guess maybe you have to have the name. I just don't want anyone to go to jail. <laughs> right. We'll just share the article, and then she can decide. Yeah. Okay. But I think in terms of uh, yeah. But I think in terms of encouraging women who go into science, what are some of the things you think about there? Well, for one thing, <laughs> that there'd be more women professors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think um, even the mentors. Mentors is a humongous thing. I think you and know. I think it's... women are particularly good mentors because they, you know, they. I think they really feel interested in the person as well as the animal. But, and I um, think yeah, there's a nurturing component to it. Yeah, like if you're going into science as a woman, I think it's a lot better than it used to be. But it's still there's still an element of sexism and. A lot of times when you get to university, you're going to see a whole lot of male professors and kind of say, where's somebody that looks like me? And it might be hard to find. But I absolutely encourage everybody, find a mentor, seek someone out. I've never been in a situation where someone asked somebody to mentor and they refused. They're always going to be, yeah, mm. sure, you know, <laughs> sure, I'll help you. And that that is right. a huge, huge part of getting over some of those barriers. And sometimes it's just a sounding block. How do I deal with this guy? He's just such a jerk. And, <laughs> and okay, here's some tools. And sometimes you have to know when to walk away. Sometimes you think I'll just keep pushing and pushing, but sometimes it's like, can't move a mountain. Why don't you <laughs> step a few and go in a different directions? So I think mentoring is a really, really important thing. And luckily I think there's enough women out there that you can probably find a mentor who can help you. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really good sound advice because sometimes um, especially as a female going into science, you can feel, it can, it can often feel lonely because you're right. I mean, I look back at the majority of my professors just in college and the majority of them were male, not saying they weren't good, not saying they weren't where they were supposed to be at that time, but yeah, it does make a difference. Yeah. When it is an expression, if you can see it, you can be it. That's right. <laughs> so if you're not seeing it, you kind of think, oh, I guess women don't become professors then. Okay. I'll find somebody else to do, right? <laughs> Unless you're Dr. Ann and a stag, in which case you do whatever you want to do <laughs> exactly. because that's your personality and you're going to pave the way. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> Very much appreciated.